¡Viva Puerto Rico! ¡Viva Puerto Rico! I'm Eddie Torres, I'm President and CEO of Grantmakers in the Arts. Welcome to Revisiting Past to Build the Future, Grantmakers in the Arts' first ever conference in Puerto Rico. I'm going to start with a land acknowledgement. Puerto Rico is on the unceded land of Boriquen, home of the Jibaro and Taino peoples, as well as many others. We ask you to join in acknowledging the Jibaro and Taino people, their communities, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. This acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to beginning the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Every community owes its existence and vitality to generations from around the world who contributed their hopes, dreams, and energy to making the history that led to this moment. Some were brought here against their will, some were drawn to leave their distant homes in hopes of a better life, and some have lived on this land for more generations than can be counted. Truth and acknowledgement are critical to building mutual respect and connection across all barriers of heritage and difference. We begin this effort to acknowledge what has been buried by honoring the truth. We are standing on the ancestral lands. We pay respect to the elders and people of this land, past and present. Please take a moment to consider the many legacies of violence, displacement, migration, and settlement that bring us together here today. And please join us in uncovering such truths at any and all public events. Please read the GIA Convening Accountability Agreements on the conference section of the GIA website or in your program for details on how to show up and remain accountable to your GIA community and also to our hosts. Now, this is the first ever conference that GIA has done in Puerto Rico. <laughs> Puerto Rico is culturally rich. It's also environmentally vulnerable. It's economically and politically vulnerable. Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory. Puerto Ricans are born U.S. citizens. Puerto Ricans can vote in presidential primaries, but cannot vote in general presidential elections. Puerto Ricans have a representative in Congress who cannot vote. Puerto Rico's budget is overseen by appointees from the mainland's federal government, mostly individuals from the corporate finance industry. And we are all a part of this complexity, right? So we are all a part of this process, and we are all actively engaging in it and recognizing that we have to behave respectfully, that we are outsiders, and recognize that we are people who have to recognize our own role in these processes. <laughs> now, mainland funders from the lower 48 do fund in Puerto Rico, and you can too. <laughs> Some of the folks who do fund here are here. Talk to them, learn from them. Just a small sample include the Ford Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies, the Mellon Foundation, Miranda Family Fund, uh, National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, National Performance Network, Cerna Foundation, Open Society Foundation, Craft Emergency Relief Fund, and the National Endowment for the Arts, as well as many others. This is a great opportunity for learning and for continued engagement and investment. We have more than 600 grant makers, national partners, organizers, advocates, and artists joining us throughout this conference and making it happen. I want to thank you all. Now it's going to bring all the GIA team members on stage for you to give them a great big thank you. But I want to start by thanking our supporters. Now your support makes GIA's work possible. Member dues are about 7% of our income. Conference registration is about 10% of our income. It's about one-third of the conference expense itself. Your grants make up more than 80% of our income. And so I want to say thank you for your support. 
I also want to say thank you for your support for this conference itself. I want to say specifically thank you to Sandra Aponte and Jeffrey Banks from the MacArthur Foundation. It was in 2018 in the circus tent in Oakland where Sandra and Jeffrey said, you know it would be amazing if we were able to bring this conference to Puerto Rico. And they made the argument at the MacArthur Foundation that Chicago has enough of a Puerto Rican diaspora that it actually made sense to support this conference in Puerto Rico. They were then joined by F. Javier Torres Campos at the Cerdna Foundation, now with NALAC. And they were joined by others. And so I just want to say thank you to all of them. Thank you to the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation, the Cerdna Foundation, Wallace Foundation, Mellon Foundation, William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, Baisley Powell Alabash Fund, Concur Technologies, Flamboyant Foundation, the Miranda Family Fund. I want to say thank you to Rockefeller Brothers Fund, Lambent Foundation, Bloomberg Philanthropies, David Rockefeller Foundation, and Banco Popular. Thank you all. I also want to thank Looking Glass Creative, the Art Walk PR, and Georgie Vega Porata Doria for making this happen. Thank you. <laughs> for any of you that wants to do uh, uh, an event in Puerto Rico, you would be crazy not to work with them. They have been an absolute pleasure. I also want to say thank you to Lingobox Translation Studio. Thank you. We want to make sure, we said to every one of our speakers, whether it's on this stage, at the breakout session, or on off-site uh, locations, you can speak in your preferred language. We will provide translation. Anybody who is speaking can speak in English or speak in Spanish. And that's thanks to Lingobox. Thank you. <laughs> I want to say thank you to our conference planning committee, to our co-chairs from Philanthropia Puerto Rico, Glenis Pagan Ortiz. <laughs> From Fundacion Flamboyan, Carlos J. Rodriguez. From the Ford Foundation, Rocio Aranda Alvarado. From Flamboyan Arts Fund Advisory Committee, Luis A. Miranda Jr. From Denver Arts and Venues, Tariana Navas Nieves. From Fundacion Banco Popular, Beatriz Polmus Lopez. From Thriving Cultures, the Cerdna Foundation, Robert Smith III. From National Association of Latino Arts and Culture, F. Javier Torres Campos. And the Vice President and Director of Programs at Grant Makers in the Arts, Nadia Lokda. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to hand it off to members of the Conference Planning Committee. From the Miranda Family Fund, Luis Miranda. From Philanthropia Puerto Rico, Glenis Pagan. And from Flamboyant Foundation, Carlos Rodriguez. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Carlos Rodriguez, Carlos J. Uh, Rodriguez Silvestre. I am the executive uh, director of Flamboyant in Puerto Rico. And some of you might remember me because I had the special honor to unveil to you last year in GIA 2022 in New York City that Puerto Rico was the destination for GIA Conference 2023. As co-chair of the planning committee, it is an honor to have each and every one of you here today, during these few days, uh, in our archipelago. As a Puerto Rican, it fills me with pride to be part of this event in which you will have the opportunity to get to know a little bit more of what makes us unique. Puerto Rico is home and is considered home to many artists who not only create great art, but also help us survive in dire times and give us relief when we most need it. Artists who have preserved our cultural heritage for decades. For the last three years, the world has gone through a pandemic and some of us have lived through natural disasters and other events who have deeply shaped our present and have meant to rethink our approach for the future. At the planning committee, we have been deeply intentional at listening, learning, and created spaces for a diversity of voices. As we gather here in a much needed space to contest our past, understand our present, 
and ideate how we approach our future, we ask you to understand there are as many opinions as Puerto Ricans, <laughs> as there are multiple layers to our identities that while rich makes it complex. It is therefore all of our role to be open and to make the best of this space to connect, to exchange knowledge, inspire creativity, and design new ways to impact the communities that we aim to serve. I hope you have a wonderful time in this conference, and I hope you have a wonderful time in Puerto Rico. Yes. Are you ready for this? <laughs> so I just want to stop and say bienvenidos. Welcome to Puerto Rico. Um, it was 2019, and I remember that it's when I met Nadia. I, don't, I can't see where she is. Um, but she came to her first recon visit uh, to Puerto Rico. And at that time, um, everybody wanted to come to Puerto Rico. We were definitely on the philanthropic map, for sure, after the hurricanes. Um, and this was going to be in 2021. It didn't happen. And, and I actually think this is the best time for this conference to happen. But it demonstrated um, a real authentic commitment to be in Puerto Rico and to, and to come in. As you heard from Eddie and as Carlos mentioned, there are many perspectives of being a Puerto Rican, a, of expressing what Puerto Rico is. Um, so you'll hear what Puerto Rico is um, from many different points of view. When we were creating this agenda, um, and we've had many conversations, I mean, since 2019 on how to show up to Puerto Rico, what to present, how to present it, and how to, how to create an awareness for people to, to really understand that. So there have been many, many conversations and the agenda has been very intentionally created for you, be, for you being able to see all the different perspectives. Um, so I invite you to um, listen, learn, digest, feel it, um, and of course, have fun and enjoy. And not to weather, we, sp we spoke with all the weather goddesses, and we are super fine during these <laughs> next couple of days. <laughs> Sir Luis. Uh, thank you, uh, Eddie, Carlos, Denise. Uh, mi nombre es Luis Miranda, bienvenidos a Puerto Rico. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, if you're here, you either give in the arts, your world is in the arts, and you were persuasive uh, in convincing your board or your boss to send you to a conference <laughs> in Puerto Rico. <coughs> so we know for sure that you may have money knowledge, and you can debate and have a persuasive argument. So I now want to call on that persuasive arguments that you really demonstrated in getting your ass here to Puerto Rico <laughs> to use it to talk to your bosses and your board to fund Puerto Rico. You have not finished your job learning about the art world in Puerto Rico uh, since yesterday for the next couple of days, and you will learn plenty and be surprised and happy about the art that is taking place in El Archipiélago. But now you have to go with that knowledge to make that second argument that it's not enough to come to a cool place donde los dioses del clima han decidido que no va a llover. <laughs> and you're going to go back, and I'm sure that as Eddie and many others talk to all of you in the years to come, you would have been able to convince your bosses and your board to invest in Puerto Rico. So that's your homework <laughs> going back. That's your job 
going back uh, to your origin somewhere uh, in the States. We have, uh, over the last five years, created the Flamboyant Arts Fund, and Christine Ergwood, it's my partner in crime. <laughs> After Maria and Irma, we decided to bring Hamilton to Puerto Rico, and that served as the basis to raise $15 million to invest in the arts in Puerto Rico. And since then, we actually have been joined by Cummings and Mellon and Bloomberg Philanthropies and Ford to augment that basic $15 million that we never thought will, number one, last forever, but we never thought that we will be around forever. We always saw it as an infusion of dollars to the arts in Puerto Rico and then others and government will take over. Well, that hasn't happened. That's why you being here, it's so important because I know that in a year, I'm gonna give you my email, you're gonna be emailing me, mira Luis, vamos a dar 100 mil pesos a tal organización in Puerto Rico, we're gonna invest $100,000 in this artist in Puerto Rico. <laughs> Definitivamente. Y yo creo que lo están oyendo también en español y en inglés. I could actually do it in both languages if needed, but we have translation. And now we have been figuring out what should be our role after that initial investment uh, since 2019 uh, when we raised the money for Hamilton. And quickly, uh, we believe that our role moving over the next decade, it's threefold. One, we have worked with the art sector in the island for five years, and we wanna make sure we pick with others a dozen or so institutions that are part of the art ecosystem in Puerto Rico that if they didn't exist, we will have to create them because that ecosystem needs those institutions and make sure that they get a basic grant for their needs. Whether they wanna pay electricity for a year, because art institutions actually pay electricity in Puerto Rico, y mucho, or fund a position or pay the executive director it's a grant for them. But money alone, it's not enough. We learn in our partnership with Bloomberg Philanthropies that technical assistance, it's needed for organizations to get better at their craft. And we believe that that is needed as well. And finally, that innovation, it's rewarded with financial support so that we continue to push the art forms in El Archipelago as much as we can. So we have our homework set up for you and we hope to join each one of you funding Puerto Rico as you go back and use the same persuasion power to get yourself here, to get money here. Thank you for being here. Agitarte is an organization of working class artists and cultural organizers who work at the intersections of ras, race, class, gender, sexuality, and ideology. Through a praxis of cultural solidarity, creative process, and popular education, they initiate and facilitate arts and cultural projects with grassroots communities that contest U.S. cultural 
hegemony. <laughs> I had trouble with this word. Hegemony and propose alternatives to existing systems of oppression. They do this in their creative work by centering the experiences of oppressed people in resistance through interdisciplinary storytelling, media, and in their mutual solidarity through trainings, workshops, and running a physical space for educational programming in Santurce, Puerto Rico. I welcome Jorge Diaz from Agitarte, artist, co-director, and co-founder. Buenas tardes. Hegemonía es una palabra difícil, pero es, es central, es central. Sí, suena hasta académica, pero de verdad es central al trabajo que hacemos. Porque de verdad, este, están hablando aquí compañeros, de que hay diferentes perspectivas, obviamente, de la realidad puertorriqueña. Pero ciertamente también hay unos discursos dominantes que son los que le llegan a la mayoría. Inclusive, un poco imaginar desde un punto de vista anticolonial, virar la pregunta. No es necesario que Puerto Rico vote por el presidente de Estados Unidos. Es obvio que no vamos a tener representación en su congreso. Realmente podemos virar eso y cada vez que nos pregunten sobre Puerto Rico, en vez de decir, ah, ellos deciden, podemos tener un marco, un lente anticolonial, desde las mismas perspectivas que hablamos, ¿verdad? Desde ese reconocimiento que hacemos de las tierras constantemente. Y desde ese lugar, el coloniaje y la situación puertorriqueña, independientemente de las opiniones que uno escuche, ¿verdad? Y las que llegan a los oídos de ustedes, por la misma cultura dominante, esa palabra hegemonía grande, pero... Eh, y quiero que tengan eso en mente, ¿verdad? Tengo poco tiempo para hablar con ustedes y quiero empezar por pedir disculpas por mi compañera de trabajo, colega, co-conspirator, sounds better in English, Su Haley no puede estar con nosotros aquí hoy, este, se enfermó esta mañana, y me dejó solo. <risa> no, eh, o sea que sí quiero este, honrar su trabajo, de verdad, porque realmente este trabajo, como todo nuestro proyecto, ¿verdad? Y quiero recalcar esto, ya que estamos en un foro de artistas, de que nuestro trabajo es colectivo. Y es un proyecto que se ha propuesto siempre, y muchas veces no cuadra con la perspectiva de lo que es el arte, ¿verdad? Porque trabajar en colectivo es algo en particular. Pero parte de nuestro entendimiento de lo que es la educación popular, y de lo que es el rol que tenemos que tener, como organización que quiere transformar nuestra realidad. Pero quiero dar un paso atrás, porque estamos haciendo ahorita, ¿verdad? gracias a Eddie eh, y a Gia y a todo el mundo, por este, esta oportunidad para nosotras, no es algo común, en Puerto Rico no se dan este tipo de foros, no hay los recursos para sentarnos a hablar sobre nuestra realidad y qué hacer necesariamente. Las organizaciones que están en el frente de la lucha no necesariamente eh, tienen esta oportunidad de dialogar, sino que estamos ahí, como dicen, en los front lines, en, la, en el frente, este, resolviendo, sobreviviendo, haciendo un trabajo de solidaridad que es tan importante. Por eso quiero reconocer aquí a uh, la presencia de todas las trabajadoras y trabajadores que están aquí, ¿verdad? Y que hacen esto posible. Quiero un aplauso, por favor, a toda la gente que... Es bien importante para nosotras reconocer todo ese trabajo y entendemos de todo el trabajo invisible que ocurre para que este tipo de actividad pueda suceder. Así que gracias a toda la gente que trabaja y que labora para lograr estas actividades. Además, quiero dar un dato, ¿verdad? Porque creo que todo es contexto y agitarte parte desde el entendimiento de que existimos como pueblo por la resistencia que ha dado Puerto Rico, ¿verdad? Por más de 125 años desde que Estados Unidos nos invadió y antes de eso por la colonia española. Y está interesante lo que este, comentar que aquí en el Caribe Hilton, primero, gracias por haber escogido un hotel que por lo menos es... Union, ¿verdad? que está unionizado, así que qué bueno que el Caribe Hilton escogieron un hotel. Es importante. Seguimos en contradicciones, pero por lo menos honrar ese trabajo y no quedarse en Airbnb que desplazan a nuestras comunidades y por lo menos que hacen un espacio en el cual apoyan a trabajadoras y trabajadores. Pero quiero hablar rápidamente para entrar en la presentación nuestra de este espacio, porque aquí también está la única playa privada de Puerto Rico. No sé si saben esto, pero en Puerto Rico las playas son públicas, o se supone. Porque, ¿verdad? Porque muchas las han ido privatizando secretamente. Pero realmente aquí está la única playa privatizada que el gobierno de Puerto Rico se la entregó al Caribe. Esto hace muchos años. Este es un lugar interesante. Eh, pero lo que me gusta recalcar es que aquí comienza igual, en el 1969, la primera lucha de playas para el pueblo. Y fueron jóvenes independentistas 
y jóvenes de aquí de Puerta de Tierra que invadieron la playa, ¿verdad? <risa> invadieron la playa y se formó una de las protestas que más gente han arrestado en las playas en Puerto Rico. Y lo menciono porque hasta el día de hoy tenemos organizaciones y colaboramos y estamos en solidaridad con muchos grupos que están protestando y defendiendo las playas de este país. Y especialmente ahora cuando el aburguesamiento es tan grande en este país y hay tantos intentos de desarrollar y convertir esto de verdad en un resort, en un hotel grande para los extranjeros. Vamos a empezar con, la, con el slideshow. I think that was a long introduction. <laughs> so I'm going to try to, uh, este, tratar de hacerle justicia a la presentación de mi compañera Sue Haley, pero este, yo tengo aquí un, ah, tengo un flicker aquí. Nada, ese es el logo nuestro. Este, ah, estoy un poquito nervioso. Eh, aquí tenemos, este, Agitarte Cum tiene 26 años y comienza en Lynn, Massachusetts, que es un, una comunidad clase trabajadora al norte de Boston. Y nada, tenemos, a mí me gusta ese diagrama que tenemos a la derecha, que es de solidaridad cultural, porque de verdad realmente uh, habla de la profundidad del trabajo que estamos de hacer. Eh, porque aunque nuestra cara es de teatro, realmente somos un proyecto que entiende que todo el trabajo produce cultura y que el trabajo cultural nuestro está ligado a la educación popular y a la transformación de la sociedad que, que, que aspiramos. Y por eso, además del arte, hemos sido una organización de que ha estado apoyando en todos los procesos, y ahí pueden ver desde los terremotos, pueden ver también... Este, de, ah, mira, tengo aquí enfrente. Ah, se me olvida. This is so nice. You have a thing in the front here. So it shows the cultural organizing. Perdón, eh, enseña también el trabajo que hacemos de agitación política. Y también algo en particular que ocurre desde el huracán en Puerto Rico, porque por muchos años nuestro trabajo no fue reconocido y inclusive era como que, ah, ese, ese arte, ese teatro que hacen, qué bonito. Pero después de la, del huracán, dado a las relaciones con muchas organizaciones del sur de Estados Unidos, y quiero reconocer aquí a, a, al proyecto de Southerners on New Ground, que son una este, organización este, hermana con la cual hemos trabajado por años. Y ese tipo de relaciones con grupos como Southerners on New Ground, y mi gente, y otro grupo así, pues nos creó unas relaciones que nos permitió convertirnos en un grupo clave como de apoyo mutuo en Puerto Rico. Y pasamos, ¿verdad?, desde este grupo de arte que mucha gente no lo reconocía a de repente tener que estar distribuyendo comida y recursos a más de 15 comunidades y ayudar en la formación de centros de apoyo mutuo. Y ese rol particular eh, tiene que ver con esta relación y cómo la hemos establecido en el arte y cómo trabajamos con organizaciones a largo plazo, entendiendo que ese trabajo es a largo plazo y que ese trabajo requiere unas relaciones que tengan profundidad para poder tener el nivel de solidaridad que necesitamos. Ah, anyway, I'm just going to enseñar rápido estas fotos, pero esto es el trabajo nuestro de máscaras, nuestro grupo Papel Machete, es un grupo, que, un proyecto independiente de teatro que surge luego de que Agitarte este, se le agotara una subvención de fondos y fuese desahuciada, eh, desplazada de su sede en las luchas en contra del desplazamiento del barrio San Mateo de Cangrejos, mejor conocido como Santurce. Este proceso que fue, ¿verdad?, un proceso de desarrollo este, auspiciado por el Museo de Arte de Puerto Rico y por desarrolladores que querían este, destruir esa comunidad. Y nada, este proyecto surge después de eso, y esto fue este, nuestros personajes que hicimos de Máscaras Príncipe el primero. Aquí esta foto este, de papel machete demuestra uno de los momentos de mayor militancia y relevancia del proyecto, que fue en el 2010, en la huelga, bueno, esto es 2011, pero la huelga estudiante del 2010-2011, eh, en la OPR, en la Universidad de Puerto Rico, en defensa de la educación pública. Y aquí vemos este, uno de los momentos más este, fuertes de la huelga, cuando quitan los portones para que no puedan ser a la Universidad de Estudiantes y nos unimos a, a, a la militancia de los estudiantes que estaban defendiendo la universidad. No, es una, buena, una imagen este, reconocida y el, la, el gigante estudiante militante fue un símbolo que se usa en toda la huelga. O sea que este títere que hicimos en tres días, en menos de un paro, se convirtió en el símbolo de la huelga y fue también una creación colectiva de gente en espacio de taller de arte que logramos allí también en la huelga. No, esto es de background, esta es la lucha que hablé de Santuso no se vende y se la quería mostrar para que ahí fue que libramos mucha lucha y esto se da antes del proceso, esto es antes del real estate bubble bursting, ¿verdad? Cuando se pretendía hacer un proyecto de, de revitalización de Santurce, que fracasa hasta que se ocurre un nueva, una nueva vertiente de artistas y de arte aquí que eventualmente llega a lo que es ahora un Santurce aburguesado, comparado muchas veces con Brooklyn. 
Ah, no, this is old stuff. I'm going to pasar esto. Son obras de teatro viejas que hicimos. Esto fue para en el Grand Puppet Theater en 1998 a los 100 años de la invasión de Estados Unidos a Puerto Rico. Este, y también siempre mucho trabajo en un papel maché y de gigante. En Caimito trabajamos junto a una organización que se llama la Comisión de Ciudadanos a Rescate de Caimito. Y como mucho de estos trabajos, nos aliamos a organizaciones de base que están haciendo trabajo organizativo en las comunidades. ¿Para qué? Para amplificar los mensajes que están tratando de llevar y para a la vez este, poder envolver a la juventud de estas personas en estos procesos. En aquí partido dice, no al paseo del monte, era justamente enfrente de la escuela allí, querían hacer un desarrollo, y la propuesta de la escuela era que le iban a cerrarla toda, poner una pared bien grande, pero le iban a dar aires acondicionados, pero para que no se molestaran los vecinos. Y le digo eso en un poquito de contexto, ¿verdad? estas cosas, voy a seguir este, con las fotos, eso fue en Caimito al principio. Este, nuestro espacio Casa Taller Cangrejera, y quiero hablar un momento rápido de espacios este, culturales, este, es importante y algo que nosotros también hemos hecho desde después de la, de la pandemia, pero después de huracán y durante la pandemia es apoyar a otros grupos a conseguir sus espacios. En Puerto Rico es bien difícil para los grupos de arte tener espacio físico, espacio de trabajo. Y esto es algo que se lo mencioné a alguna gente que hemos hablado, hablamos ayer de que desde Agitarte entendemos que fortalecer y ayudar a conseguir fondos para otras organizaciones y proyectos es fundamental para el crecimiento de toda la comunidad artística de este país y para nuestra resistencia como pueblo, para asegurarnos de que podamos continuar existiendo. Perdón, es que esta, esta, esta presentación era de Sir Hayley y yo no me la sé y estoy como que tratando aquí de correrla con ustedes, no ponerme nervioso, pero, pero estos trabajos que hicimos después del huracán ¿no? de apoyo mutuo, ¿verdad? Y, y de repente... No, no planificamos, yo creo que esto es importante mencionarlo, que nosotros no planificamos en convertirnos en una organización de apoyo mutuo, no planificamos hacer mucho del trabajo, pero sí entendemos que desde el trabajo tenemos que responder, ¿verdad? Y no reaccionariamente, sino responder con propuestas ante las estaciones que se ocurren en este país. Y papel machete, cuando empieza en el 2005, que empieza en ese gubernamental uh, del país que el gobierno cierra para imponernos un tax, cuando nos fundamos ahí dijimos, esto es un proyecto de crisis. Y no porque queríamos ser negativos, ¿eh? porque tenemos que entender que nuestro rol era de poder responder desde nuestro trabajo ante la crisis que en ese momento, el 2006, ¿verdad? no sabía que íbamos a acabar donde estamos hoy con esta privatización masiva, con una junta de control fiscal que nos asfixia. Pero sí sabíamos que era el principio de otra etapa en el país. Y por eso hemos seguido tratando de estar ahí, ¿verdad? Y pues tenemos un espacio que se llama Casa Taller Cangrejera, todo esto pueden ver este en agitarte.org, si quieren ver el trabajo nuestro, está bastante bien documentado. Eh, esto es un poco para enseñarles el trabajo de máscara. Eh, esto es una obra que se llama La Operación, que se hizo, la primera chica la hizo en el 2012, y es sobre la esterilización masiva de mujeres en Puerto Rico. No sé si saben, por tres generaciones en Puerto Rico, un programa de eugenesia de Estados Unidos, este, se llegaron a esterilizar en el punto más alto hasta mitad de las mujeres de eh, childbearing age, de que posiblemente se podían ¿verdad? gestar, personas gestantes. Y ese proceso fue un proceso bien violento. Y como casi todo en este país, bien poco documentado, aunque les puedo recomendar un gran documental, se llama La Operación, por Ana María García, una de nuestras mejores documentalistas de este país. Está en YouTube y está gratis. Pero eh, tratamos de traer, ¿verdad? de añadir y ¿verdad? explorar una estética dentro de lo que es la resistencia, de lo que es la lucha, de lo que es retomar la historia, la memoria del país. Y el otro proyecto principal nuestro se llama Datos y Dibujos, que es un proyecto que, que responde a las estaciones que está pasando el país. Y ese proyecto, pues, contratamos y facilitamos la participación de artistas visuales, ¿verdad? Para poder este, hacer nuestra, llevar a cabo, ¿verdad? Los mensajes que quieren esas personas también este, trabajar. Y trabajamos aquí, ¿verdad? En Puerto Rico y también en solidaridad este, con organizaciones en Estados Unidos que hemos trabajado, como les dije, por mucho tiempo. Todo esto, todo nuestro trabajo, todos nuestros posters están online, agitarte.org, gratis, for free download, para descarga gratis. <risa> eh, y nada, y como que déjame seguir aquí. Esto fue nosotros apoyando, ¿verdad?, esta formación, trabajando con la marea verde, ¿verdad?, en defensa del aborto, los derechos de aborto en Puerto Rico. Aquí tenemos una derecha cristiana bien similar a los Estados Unidos, está tratando de privar a a las personas gestantes de sus derechos, entre otras cosas. Entre, y verdad, es por eso es que yo muchas veces hablo, ¿verdad? Y las personas que me conocen aquí, este, compañeros que trabajamos en el sur, este, en mover la línea de que Puerto Rico comparte muchas de las condiciones 
del sur de los Estados Unidos, aunque somos un país invadido, aunque somos una colonia, tenemos los mismos niveles económicos, tenemos la misma derecha cristiana que empuja estas medidas que hemos estado viviendo y presenciando en todos los estados, las medidas antitrans, las medidas antimujeres, etc. Este, así que nosotros es bien importante a, a alinearnos con estos proyectos que siempre hemos apoyado para el alcanzar a decir presente. ¿Se me trancó? Ah, ok. Esto es nada, esto es... Y esto es más arte, pero yo creo que el mensaje este, que fue una, es como un lema que tomamos después del huracán, que es solidaridad y sobrevivencia para nuestra liberación. Muchas veces la gente trata de hablar de liberación de Puerto Rico como una cosa de estatus, de que Estados Unidos decía mañana que somos Estados, somos los... Pero nosotros vemos el proceso liberatorio como los procesos de lucha que aseguran que nuestras comunidades puedan vivir. Y después del huracán fue bien claro que nos teníamos nosotras, que teníamos que nosotros mismos hacer todo el trabajo de solidaridad para poder sobrevivir. Y en ese momento un compañero, eh, Giovanni Roberto, que corre un gran proyecto en Puerto Rico este, como de obras sociales junto a otras grandes compañeras, este, nos dijo, mira, necesitamos gente en las líneas, tenemos gente muriéndose de hambre, haciendo fila de 50 a una hora, cayéndose, desmayándose del hambre, necesitamos el teatro en la calle. Y nosotros pensando de que no hacía falta, nos volvieron a reafirmar que sí, que este trabajo de educación popular, este trabajo de agitación política es esencial, aunque inclusive muchas veces ya sepamos lo que es ese reflejo, ese espejo, de poder mirarnos y poder entender nuestra situación colectiva y esta pieza solidaridad y sobrevivencia para nuestra liberación es una de esas piezas que, que pudimos lograr. Ah, esa es Sugeli ahí, mira, que está apuntando, y Rocío. Nada, estos son varios proyectos, también hacemos proyectos de murales este, con diferentes proyectos, aquí con Jornadas Acababan las Promesas, Jornadas Acababan las Promesas es, es una coalición, un grupo que se forma para resistir a la Junta de Control Fiscal y llevan años haciendo militancia. Eh, ah, Claro, este yo no lo había visto. Uf, maybe you can read this one in English. Ah, ok, pero sí, y les hablé de esto, pero de verdad siempre hemos hecho, de verdad, además de que tratamos de gastar la mayoría de nuestros recursos en gente, 70% de nuestro presupuesto va a pagar artistas, a pagar a gente. Eh, además, pues tratamos de hacer, este, de también redistribuir este, lo que nos llega a otras organizaciones. Y creo que esto es importante porque creo que muchas veces se subestima la capacidad de las organizaciones, especialmente de los artistas, de la capacidad de participar en un proceso que de verdad convierta esto, este, este, este granting, regranting, este dinero, estos recursos, que haya más participación de la gente que produce y que sabe lo que hace falta a nivel de las bases. No me esperaba este slide. <risa> y estos son algunas de nuestras artes, ¿verdad? También en solidaridad uh, que hicimos. Actually, este, esta arte a la izquierda es de Suheili que hizo, hizo después de estos terribles acontecimientos, y al lado derecho de Estefanía. Son dos compañeras que ¿verdad? son artistas de proyecto. Y quiero terminar con nuestra nueva obra, nuestro nuevo show, que es nuestra obra más ambiciosa, y curiosamente es la primera, el primer proyecto de arte que ha sido respaldado este, por la comunidad de filantropía. Este, todos los que solicitamos, pues, <risa> finalmente nos han dado, nunca nos han dado nada ahora. Hemos podido financiar este proyecto, yo creo que también porque cae en un momento bien particular, ¿verdad? Llevamos cinco años con este proyecto, pero la cuestión de la abolición, desde la tradición puertorriqueña que ya la existe, desde la tradición de Betance, estas personas que trabajaron por la abolición de la esclavitud y la abolición en Puerto Rico, hasta la lucha, ¿verdad?, de las mujeres feministas radicales negras de los Estados Unidos que por años han llevado la bandera de lo que es el abolicionismo como una lucha esencial para poder derrumbar los sistemas opresivos que nos apestan. Esta obra, que les voy a enseñar un trailer en un momento, es sobre el último día de la última cárcel de territorios liberados, antes conocidos como los Estados Unidos de América. Ocurre en el 2047 y Neva, que es su Haley, la compañera que, está con, que debería estar aquí, <risa> eh, va con un, gru un, un grupo de gigantes desde Puerto Rico a ayudar a, en solidaridad para derrumbar esta última cárcel. Pero es mejor que vean una imagen, porque es como que science fiction se ve mejor imagen. Así que tengo un videito por ahí. Este, si puede aquí, mi gente técnica, bien a fuego, gracias allá al, al corillo. Es un proyecto un minuto y después vamos a preguntas y eso. I am Neva. I am a cultural worker, revolutionary storyteller. I am part of a mass of survivors and freedom fighters speaking to you from the year 2047, where we are on the eve of the abolition. 
the state always targets our peoples to criminalize and enslave us. Yet, we rise. You see, if you're here in Puerto Rico, 8th, 9th, and 10th of December in the Victoria Pinosa, and if you're in the U.S., we'll have a tour next fall, so stay tuned. On the eveabolition.com, you can check out. Sí. Vamos a, vamos a, a coger algunas preguntas. Sí. We're going to go ahead and take some questions, but we, before we, we open it up, yo tengo para le preguntas, Jorge. Um, tengo dos, dos específicas. Eh, cuéntame un poco de este comienzo que empezaron en Massachusetts, terminan haciendo trabajo en Puerto Rico. Uh -huh. Creo que hablo un poco de lo que hablamos al principio, la complejidad de, esta, de las relaciones. Uh -huh. Eso, y, y quiero que hables un poco de lecciones aprendidas, ¿verdad? ¿Qué ha funcionado, qué no ha funcionado? Pero cuéntame un poco de, de esos inicios y, y lo que motivó la entrada hacia Puerto Rico oh, también. We should switch to English now, I think, or no? I don't know. That's cool, right? I think it's probably easier. <laughs> should we? No, I just think it's a speak quicker. I did the first part in Spanish because I was on a fan follow Sue Haley's thing, but then I didn't follow it at all because I was kind of nervous and I couldn't read. But I think it's, no, I think it's more, you know, because of the language, sometimes it's easier and I want to make sure we don't have a lot of time. So I, I sure. wanted to start and honor that in Puerto Rico and as a colony of the U.S. that, you know, that we prioritize, uh, you know, the language that we've been expressing ourselves for many, many years. And it's a language of resistance, even if it's, From the Spanish colony, it's still a language of resistance nowadays. So, so gracias. Gracias. Um, so, so, I yes. had... <laughs> yeah, the first question was about our origins. Well, I, I am born and raised in Santuza, Puerto Rico, but um, uh, I, I went uh, to the U.S. in the 90s to, to, to study uh, film and television and, and Emerson College uh, with a lot of student financial aid and a lot of grants. Oh, there's some Emerson people here? No, well, anyway. Um, <laughs> seem like it, right? No, it's cool. It's cool. It's, it's all right. It's all right. Um, so... Um, And, and then, I mean, long story short, I was hired by a nonprofit, which is an interesting story for another time, um, back in 94, when, when nonprofits were, had to diversify and, and had to hire people of color, because if not, the foundations wouldn't give them money, which was, you know, anyway, which was really a strategy to try to recruit people to the Democratic Party. But that's another subject. We talk about it some other time. But really, uh, um, the beginnings of our, 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 our project start because I met an incredible human being from Colombia, a popular educator, Juan Carlos Ortega, I want to recognize him, who was deported. Um, um, by the Clinton administration when he was in college and working with us. But um, he introduced me to popular theater. I, I got dropped in, like, dropped into these neighborhoods in Roxbury. I don't know if you all know Boston folks. Okay, cool. Academy Homes. You know Academy Homes? All right, so that's the first place I organized. They just dropped me in there, like, yeah, go do some organizing in there. But in that process, I was like, oh, wait, popular education has a big role. Our people need this, this, this kind of approach, not like this campaign shit, but like we need popular education that we can, so we can reach our folks, right? So that's how it started, and we were lucky and, and, and blessed that a bunch of folks joined us. And there was people who were in college activists, community members, folks that were brought in to, you know, to, to lend to SALT and the unions. So it was very diverse from the beginning, um, the project. But the reason why I didn't sustain, because honestly, nobody understood or believed the work that we did. It was like these young people doing hip hop and speak outs and talking about radical theater. It was like, no way, we can't fund this. What is this thing? So that's why eventually it dies out in, uh, in the U.S. And when I come here to take care of my mother, that's multiple sclerosis for over 30 years, um, um, yeah, we started locally. And, and, and again, it's been a rocky, you know, in terms of funding and all that, but, but, but the need and the work, and we decided a long time ago that we would do this work regardless. Of course, as working class folks, yeah, yeah. Thank you. We've been doing it. It's a life project. Nonprofit is a vehicle. It's not the essence. It's not who we are. It's we need it to survive because we are working class folks. And about 10 years ago, uh, we realized that if we didn't, I mean, we had a nonprofit from the beginning. One of our old members got it, but we were like, we, we don't want to deal with that. Like, you know, which are radicals. Nah. But eventually it was like, no, we need to use this vehicle to be able to sustain folks. We got to like really think of new ways and creative ways. And it shouldn't be the only way. We should have for-profit, non-profit, underground, cooperatives, right? We need all kinds of funding and resourcing for this work. Yeah. 
Um, but anyway, that's where we come from, and that's why after a lot of struggle in Puerto Rico, we were able to reignite the project, and, and, and here we are um, trying to do what we can. Definitely, awesome. And I think from the artist's perspective, we've always, in Puerto Rico, the artists have been the ones who, who have that resistance streak. So I'm, I'm not sure when, si tú te criaste con los rayos gamma, <laughs> political, oh, political satire. satire is usually our th I mean, we love that. So yeah, of course we have <laughs> so a political I satire. Mean, and even the artists, there's many, many. Uh, this is where the that resistance kind of yeah. kind of uh, expresses itself. So I also want to know about lessons learned. What has worked from from all this work? And and you kind of started mentioning about nonprofits and and that relationship. Um, I know we had a, a difference in the sector, philanthropic and, and nonprofit sector, after the hurricanes. Um, what have you learned? What has worked? What hasn't worked? Um, and then I'll probably ask you for right. input on, on best ways of funding collectives, right. which sure. is kind of a, what Ajitarte is. Um, and then we'll open it for questions. Right. So I think, um, I think we're still trying to figure out what works. Right, I think, and this is, and I say this because there is this, you know, we had to apply to four foundation proposals this month while we're in the middle of our biggest creative project, and it was like, it's not, we have to do it, but but um, so I I tell you what, from the perspective of what has worked, I, I have to say that it's that it's the long the long relationships, that it's the, you know, like. If we have to come back every year or every two years to get some minor menu funding, and that's not us. Like, we are blessed that we have some funding, that we actually have possibilities. But most of the folks that we know that we work with, they, they have even no clue, right? So when he was not coming here to me, it's like, oh, I don't like to speak. I don't know how to speak for like, no, just do yourself. Just do your thing because there's like a language and there's an, um, a, um, a distance, right? Like, not always the foundations have their ear to the ground in the sense that, oh, here, fill our portal out. I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll fill your portal out, but where's the accountability? Like, uh, how do we build relationships that actually you all are accountable to us too? You know, like, and, and I want to say that there's great, and I'm sure, as I know some of you are here, there's great individuals doing that work. And the only reason why we got in some funding, you know, a bunch of like lefty artists, puppeteers, you know, like it, 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 pro independence folks, is because folks like you who are in philanthropy who have been like, no, these people are doing the work. So, and I know it's hard, and I know and that, w that transforming the actual systems, right? That transforming, that to think of a re real redistribution of wealth uh, would be a way to like, you know, right, to, to propose the opposite, but we don't have that power. So I think what has worked is the relentless efforts of folks inside to try to shift as much as that can be philanthropy. And I, I think that's, that's, that's clear to those of us who are on the ground, it's very clear. And I feel responsibility to talk about that. I mean, I, I don't like to talk about it. And, and I know at points, the things we say might put a jeopardy the possibility of funding. But I don't care anymore in the sense that we have to open up. We have to, we, we like, if not now, when? How much longer are we going to wait? How much more hoarding are going to foundations that wealthy people do while the world is collapsing? And that's a, I don't have the money. That's a question for people who actually have the access. And how you stop hoarding money and start really moving it, because if not now, when? Like, what more evidence do we need? What more of the destruction of the world? And then the verge of probably nuclear bombs being dropped again, or actually, or in Palestine, more than nuclear bombs being thrown on them. So, I mean, we're living it. So if not now, when? And it's an immediacy that I, I have to mention, and I have to quote our friend Ashley Wooder Henderson, who's our colleague and, 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 and from, you know, from Highlander, who says, fund us like you want us to win. Really, like, fund us like you want us to win. And I think it's basic. It's basic. It's just, we're going to keep doing it, but if you fund us like that, maybe we can do more. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, sorry. Definitely. Thank you. And <laughs> <laughs> no need to shy away. Um, I, from from my, my point of view, I, I totally echo what you're saying, and I say commit, you know, just like Luis was saying. Um, truly, truly commit. Like you mentioned, oh, you can give us a little grant here and there, and you know, Puerto Rico's like trending now and all this stuff, but um, commit, commit to, to funding. So do we have any questions? We'll go right there. Everything was answered, Every that's why. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> 
anything you're curious about of the work, the organization, of Jorge personally? <laughs> yes. I think there's one here. There's a microphone Maybe somewhere. We have a mic. Nuestra gente bella de técnica, hay un micrófono por ahí. A los corredores, there's two questions. There's one here and over there. Hay think, micrófono. I think she has a mic, then we'll have a mic. Okay, cool. Ah, ya veo, ya veo. Perdón, es que estas luces no se ve bien. Thank you guys so much. This is a fantastic presentation. I just think with all of the uh, voices of power in this room, you talked about some of your colleagues out there in the field that also need support. Would you mind uh, giving us some names? Oh, wow. The, like, the, yeah. That might take up the whole space of this, right? Well, but, but, I mean, but that's what when I think people in this room need to hear too, right? right? You mean like artist organizations locally? Or, I mean, this is an arts funding circle, right? So it's not all the organizing outfits, but more like the culture and arts organization. I mean, I can definitely highlight groups that we work with. In Mayagüez, we have groups like Taller Libertad and Bemba PR2, amazing, amazing folks in the, in, the, in, the, in the West Coast. Actually, we have a dear friend, Joel, here from Artimania, a local project of, of workshops and, and art, art projects. I haven't seen all the folks. Hay gente de Puerto Rico aquí? artista de Puerto Rico aquí? Hay alguien? No? Ya lo está cabrón. Ahí fallaron. Ahí fallaron. Yeah, yeah. Are there any artists from Puerto Rico here? Okay. Bueno, <laughs> That's fucked este, up. You failed there. Aquí en San Dulce este, trabajamos con gente como El Angar. Que, y hay otros proyectos también, I think, funding. There's a lot of emerging uh, LGBTQ groups in Puerto Rico that need to be supported as well. Um, yeah. Um, there's the work of anti-racist organizations like Etnica. And we, have, we work with, uh, very closely with people in Loiza for many years against displacement. And we work with El Ancon de Loiza, which some of you might be going today or something, or went. Juan P, that's our, that's our, it, it's one of our artists and made the masks for us, many of the masks for a show, but also uh, we're in deep relationship with folks in Loiza. Um, damn, I don't want to miss anybody. Damn. Um, yeah. I mean, we, a lot of our, our networks, too, are people who do mutual solidarity work, mutual aid, La Centro de Apoyo Mutuo, who do cultural programming, but not necessarily you know, arts organizations, but I've noticed a lot of organizations, you know, more and more doing cultural work and, and including it as an in integral part, which is great because there's, there's very little funding for those work, especially intersections of actually organizing an art, right? Like, not talking about museums, not talking, which are great, not talking about, you know, events, we're talking about like actual organizing an art. But um, if you're interested, we can also connect. I don't want to blank out now on other groups, but there's certainly, we're definitely um, uh, more than willing to share what, what we know. Thank you, thank you for asking. Yeah, there's 14 mutual aid centers around Puerto Rico, and, and I mean, we can definitely get you that information. There was another question? Can you uh, ask that, no? Was that the same question? <laughs> there's another question over there. Uh, the question. Hello. Uh, Orion. Yes. Or oh, hey. Oh, my gosh. Um, <laughs> We love also, this moment. I love we also know each other from when we fight, when, when we Where? fight, we win. Good yes. to see you again. Good to see pleasure, you. Pleasure, pleasure. Family, good to see you. Yes, yeah, good to see you. So my question is um, a little more about uh, longevity and intersectionality and like how we pace ourselves. So I mean, with what you shared, thank you so much for sharing your work. And it seems like you're holding an ensemble, you're holding a collective. And we're dealing with massive systems of oppression, some that can intrude on our personal lives, could intrude day to day, and I know that Puerto Rico deals with all these different issues, so my question to you is as you're putting together like a wide, versatile power um, to nurture your communities you know, you, with what you just shared, like what are some practices or ways that you find yourself nourishing yourself, nourishing your community, and ways that you build the long arc, because oftentimes we can get burnt out, oftentimes we've been distanced and disconnected, um, sometimes we have internal conflicts between coalitions that we care about, right? So, like, how do we work mm -hmm. on building that um, resilience together? Yeah, thank you. Gracias. Um, it's, it's a little bit of a tough question because I'm old, right? I'm old school. Like, I'm like, I come from the era of, like, burnout? What the, what, what the hell is burnout? Like, you just keep going. You just keep going. Like, and then I think we've, in a way, gone from one extreme to the other. Right? I come from a tradition of anti-imperialist work and all that people would meet and speak for six hours a night, right? Socialist organizations, anarchist organizations. People sit and talk forever and try to solve things. It's not like we have an hour and I got to go, you know? But also, of course, I understand the fact that we are working class. Well, many of us are working class people, or if even if you're middle class, you're working and trying to have a life. So I get that. But at the same time, it's like, I mean, this is part of the problem of the professionalization of this work, is that when you work 40 hours for your nonprofit, of course, I'm not 
our, even our workers, we don't exploit them. We don't ask them to give volunteer work like they asked me in my first job. You have to get to 10, 20 hours a, w a week of volunteer work. No, we don't ask for that. But we who lead the organization, we're movement folks. So we work 50, 60 hours a week every week. It's not a question. There's no way of doing this work any other way. The rest is fooling yourselves. You know, and when it was a hurricane, it was 14 hour days, 16 hour days, and this, I don't know how long I can keep doing it. We try to be healthy, but how many working class people in this country can be healthy, can go work out, or, or can go do yoga, or can, and which is beautiful. Again, I'm not trying to discredit or minimize healing work, but actually my cohort who's not here, she's very critical of the, of the healing work outside of the struggle. So it needs to happen within. Same thing, like we have to be even more resilient, more understanding, it's not about you. It's a bigger struggle. So our needs, my needs, are definitely valid. But they can't go over the collective needs. And I'm not going to pause or destroy a movement because I need something that I can't get in this space. Anyway, that's a bigger subject. But, <laughs> but you know, you all know. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. And yeah. I could be wrong, but at least I think that perspective is valuable in the context of the work. Even if we disagree, I would love to keep talking about it. I don't pretend to have the answer, but it's a problem. And I, I'm glad you brought it up. Absolutely. Service in action is love. Other questions? Thank you. Buenas tardes a todos. Uh, ah, yeah. Good afternoon to everybody. I have a few, like one question, but also a statement too. Um, really appreciate everyone that came here to Puerto Rico. Um, I also want to point out like, it's hard when you don't have Puerto Rican artists in the space to also talk about what is happening in Puerto Rico. So that's really tough especially when we're trying to create an environment or inclusion in a conference. So I have to point that out. I know everyone worked really hard yes. to make this happen, but also I have to acknowledge that part of the process is like how to include the people of the community, and they are not here. Um, so also when we have, because I work in the nonprofit sector here in Puerto Rico, how hard is to get funded? Like how the process and how you have to make it unless you connect and you are part of the wheel and you know the system, how to track and break the system to get funding. And for you, one of the questions that I have is just like, what would be the recommendation for the people make a really well ground uh, foundation or give money to the people that need it most to the work? What would be the key phase that they have to do to make it more simple and to be more connected to the reality of what the artists are living in Puerto Rico. Thank you. Thank you for that. And I, I actually have a, it's, I'm glad you brought this question up because, I mean, I, I, again, I, I can talk from, from our, exp our collective experience. And um, um, you mentioned about funding, but you, where you, you started with um, the, exact, no, no, exact, see, but uh, when, when, you, when you talk about this idea of getting funding, we went a long way around. We were never have been darlings of the funding world. We never fit the descriptions of funding. So for us, we did it through the grassroots organizations that we work with. And that, of, I think, is a matter of timing, of being in the right place, of actually doing the work for many years. So for example, uh, we are in the steering committee of, of Southern Power Fund. I don't know if you know what Southern Power Fund is. If you don't, you should. It's a very interesting, thank you. Which actually, one of my colleagues, Wendy Schenefeld, is around from Alternate Roots. Somewhere on here. Oh, where you go. We are the two artist organizations represented within the Southern Power Fund, which is a, 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 a group of organizations that came together after the, during the pandemic to fund in the South. Like to tell foundations, just give us money. We know what we need to do. We, need, we know what we need to fund. We're going to move the money. And, 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 and that's exactly what has happened. We moved, I don't know where we're at. We were at 10 million in the next three years, but I think we're over that. We're at 13 already. Oh, eight, eight, eight million. Um, in Puerto Rico, hundreds of organizations. Um, you said 18? Oh my God, I'm definitely lost track. 18 million now, I thought it was like 10. Anyway, and this is where no, no proposals, no reports, right? But based on the structures and networks for years being built by organizations by Summers in Your Ground, Highlander Center, Project South, Alternate Roots, and then some of us who were just a smaller, smaller fish that got invited because of the relationships. And it was thanks to Mary Hooks, and I wanna big up Mary Hooks, um, from Movement for Black Lives, a uh, great organizer, wonderful organizer, and a sister who got us in that space because you knew the importance of being in those spaces and having organizations that are not foundations, that have the ear to the ground. And it's a great responsibility. Sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't want to do this. But we have to, right? And we've been able to move a quarter of that funding to arts or arts-related organizations. So that's very, that's why 
when it's like, you got to stay here. Because it's like, we really feel a responsibility. And there's, here's an opportunity. And I mention it as an example. It's not a perfect example. No. But there's different ways you can give. There's different ways. If you're really about it. I remember having a foundation officer one day cry in front of us, Maria, like, we can't give to you. I'm like, yes, you can. You can figure out different ways. It's just that you have to have the will. And, of course, your board of trustees has to be down with it, right? Or whatever, the director's board, whatever board. But, but th this is the thing. Like, where is the will? If there's a will, definitely can figure out ways of making it happen. So I think it has to be a recommitment. And I think it has to be a process of, of, of shifting those relationships and allowing more folks on the ground to be part of those processes. Good. Gracias. This... We're at the end. Jorge will be available for more questions and conversations. Gracias, Jorge. Gracias, Aitarde. Aplauso. Gracias. Y vía Puerto Rico Libre. Vía Palestina.